I'm always excited that you guys are here. This is part four of our um, Kingdom of God series. I think uh, the name is Polemology. Is it up there? That's uh, the study of, it's not the study of pole dancing. That's what Dustin said. It's the study of uh, war, warfare, spiritual warfare. It's the study of war. Amen? Uh, and so we've gone through uh, the Godhead, who the Godhead was, right? Who's the Godhead? Who's, who's God? Anybody? The Father? Who else? The Son? And who else? And the Holy Spirit, right? That's the Godhead. There are three in one. That's who we serve. Amen? That's who is our protector. That is who is our provider. God. Jesus. Amen? So that is the God that we serve. Then we learned about our enemy. Who is our enemy? Satan is our enemy, right? Satan and all the, the demons and the powers that come with Satan, right? Then we learned about angels and demons, right? How S Satan was an angel, but he became, a, he became the devil after that. So this is part four. Part four is going to be about uh, who we are. And how we talk to God. I guess I can summarize it by saying that. Lately, I've been on a, on a nutritional journey. Uh, I've been desperately trying to lose weight. Um, I need to lose weight so that I can strengthen my core. Uh, because I have back issues. I have two herniated discs. And then I have two bulging discs which really um, stopped me from doing the things that I want to do. So uh, Dr. Nicole is working with me, and she says that if I can strengthen my core, I won't need back surgery. So that's my goal. My goal is to strengthen my core, and it's working. I've been doing these exercises for my stomach, and, and I've been getting better. I've been getting stronger. Uh, but you know, as I've been trying to lose weight, I've noticed one thing. Uh, it's not as easy as it used to be uh, when I was younger. Now I have to try a lot harder, be smarter about what I eat, and I definitely have to be more disciplined uh, just to get the same results that I used to get. I've been trying to eat the right foods, incorporate exercise, and drink lots of water. And I'm watching, uh, I'm watching videos on health and nutrition so I can get a better understanding of, of how my body works. Anybody else watching videos on, on health and nutrition? Uh, how to boost my metabolism, how to get better sleep. I need better sleep. I've noticed that if I'm well rested, I'm in a much better mood. I don't need to rely on coffee as much, and I'm not as easily annoyed. My poor daughter has suffered the brunt of my annoyance when I am annoyed. Back in the day, 10 years ago when I was annoyed, she used to say, Dad, I think you need a beer. And we'd go get me a beer, and then I'd get in a way better mood. Now that I'm saved, she says, Dad, I, I think you need a Starbucks. And so now we go to Starbucks. And I get in a better mood because I have coffee, right? This runs in my family. I have a sister who suffers from the same disease as me. Uh, she's, not here. she's not here. She's not sitting in the back right now. So these are all things that I need for my physical body, right? 
these are because I'm I'm human. I'm physical, and I live on this earth. There are things I need for my physical body, but I'm also a spiritual being. I'm also a a spiritual being. It's like I'm half physical man or flesh man, and I'm half spirit man. But before I was, but this whole time, well, before I got saved, my spirit was dead. Because Ephesians chapter 2 says that I was dead in my sin and in my trespasses, but I wasn't physically dead. I was spiritually dead. It's not until you come to Christ that your spirit wakes up, that your spirit is becomes alive. And then there's that term being alive in Christ, right? It's not until you come to meet Jesus and accept him and start living for him that that spirit wakes up and God starts to live inside of you. God himself, Jesus starts to live inside of you. And Romans chapter 8 talks about the spirit man and the flesh man. But before that, I need to prove to you. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says this. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So there it is. God formed a man and he breathed life into his nostrils, therefore giving him his spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from God. Amen. So our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within us. So therefore, we are flesh and we are spirit. We have to get this down packed. Because we solely, we just, we just concentrate on the physical. We hardly ever concentrate on the spiritual. And that's what I'm going to try to get across today. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. So the spirit of the Lord is the lamp of the Lord, and it searches all his innermost parts. Job 32, 8 says, but it is the spirit in man, the breath of the almighty that makes him understand. Amen. We would have no understanding without. Uh, we would have no understanding without the spirit of God. Let me tell you what Romans 8, 5 through 9 says. So I have a spirit man and a flesh man, and they're constantly at war with each other. Romans 8, 5 says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live in accordance with the spirit have their, have their minds set on what the spirit desires. So does everyone understand that? If I live according to my flesh, that's all I'm thinking about. It's what I feed. I feed my flesh. I feed my flesh anything it wants. I, I give it anything it wants because I'm not living by the Spirit. So if I'm not living by the Spirit, then there is no need to stop my flesh from having whatever it wants, whether good or bad. It doesn't matter because I have, if I have no Spirit in me, then I feed my flesh whatever it wants. 
That's the spirit. That's the flesh man. The flesh man feeds his flesh. If I want it, I can have it. If I want it, I'll do it. That's the, that's the thinking of the flesh man. The spirit man doesn't think like that. The spirit man is in line with the spirit of God. It's in line with the word of God. And so you're made up of two parts. You're made up of spirit and flesh. And so you're constantly warring with each other. But <clears throat> you have to start now that you've come to Christ because your flesh isn't going to take you to heaven. It can try, but it won't. It can't. Your spirit will take you to heaven. The spirit of God inside of you will take you to heaven. So although we live in a physical realm, we're also part of a spiritual realm. And here's the thing. There are two ways to get into the spiritual realm. Through God or through Satan. Because I used to be heavily into drugs. And I used to see in the spirit. But it wasn't, I wasn't seeing, I wasn't seeing what God was seeing. I was seeing what Satan was seeing. I was seeing really evil things. And people who dwell in that type of spirit have have ugly feelings. They have feelings. <clears throat> it's just demonic. It's evil. It's not right. And so you can see in the spirit demonically that the American Indians also, they would visit their spirit animal and they would take peyote, but it's the spirit of pharmacia. They would use the spirit of pharmacia, which is also what I was using. I was also using the spirit of pharmacia to see, to see the demons and different things that were in the spiritual realm and when I was in there, I had no business being in there. So the Lord would cause me to see things. He would open my eyes to see things that would freak me out. And that's why I didn't want to be in that realm anymore. So you could either be in that realm demonically, or you can be in that realm, you know, through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, now when you're in the when you're in the when you're in that realm with the Holy Spirit. He causes you to be able to see demons oppressing people. You can see people, you can see people's lives that are oppressed. They're not living right because this demon won't leave them alone because they have given them legal right to be there. And they're constantly asking, why is my life like this? Why, why does Satan keep messing with me? Yet there's things in their lives that they won't get rid of. And there's, they won't submit to the Lord and what he's asking them to do. So they're constantly, now they're in war, but they're losing. They're constantly losing this spiritual battle because God has given them the tools. He's equipped them, but they refuse to pick them up and use them against this spiritual war that they're in. So... It says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So it's up to you what you're going to set your mind on. If you're going to set your mind on the flesh, then know you're going to have a really hard time. You may have a really hard time still if you set your mind on the Spirit, but at least you'll have the Holy Spirit helping you, guiding you through whatever it is you're going through. And when and it's way easier to wage war when you're have when you have the Holy Spirit on your side. Because he does the fighting for you. Physically, you have to do the fighting. You have to quit. Stop using drugs on your own. Stop drinking on your own. And a lot of the times, for us who are in that community, we fail. We constantly fail. We're constantly falling. We just can't do it on our own. That's because we have our mind set on, on the flesh. But if we were to keep our minds, if we were to do it spiritually, 
we find, I have found, that it's way easier with the Holy Spirit on my side to give up an addiction, to to stop sinning, to stop, to stop a particular sin, something that always beat me, something that would not leave me alone, something that I could not stop on my own. When I relied on the Spirit to help me, it helped me get through that. Verse 6 says, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So there it is there. I, I explained it a moment ago. But the mind governed by the flesh is death. You're not going to win. You may be able to win for a minute, and you may be, you may be able to go uh, your whole life. My father is very disciplined. My father one day quit smoking cigarettes. After 25 years, he said, I'm not going to smoke cigarettes anymore, and he kicked the habit. He's very disciplined, but his mind is set on the flesh, and he has not submitted to the Lord and he has not gone to Jesus, nor does he look for Jesus. And he has this, this mentality about God. I don't know where he got it. But he, he, he's told me different things about God. And I'm like, where do you get that from? He's like, well, it's what my mom and my dad taught me. And I'm like, well, where did they get it from? They got it from somewhere. But it's not right. It's not what the Bible teaches. So he refuses, and my mom has talked to him about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit. And he's just like, oh, you know what, that's too deep. I, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm not trying to get into any of that. And so just, I don't want to hear about that. So he's set on the flesh. So help me to pray for my dad. This is why. Verse 7 tells us why. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Did you guys know that? That the mindset on the flesh is, is hostile to God? It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so? Verse 8. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are in the realm of the flesh. Are You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. Amen. If indeed... The Spirit of God lives in you. How many of us here has, has the Spirit of God living in them? Amen. Every hand should go up. Amen. Every hand should go up, right? And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So the Bible says, if you're not of your father, Jesus, then you're of your father, Satan. It's, it's, it's either one or the other. You either belong to Christ or you belong to Satan. There is no other. And anyone else who tells you that is sadly mistaken. There it is. If you read, uh, go back on your own time. Read Romans chapter 8. It guides you on life in the Spirit. It talks more about life in the Spirit. This was just a piece that I cut out, that a, a small text that I used about life in the Spirit. <clears throat> so, back to my nutritional stuff. If my flesh man eats food and drinks water because... I need to eat food and drink water to survive. Um, I was going to do, a, I was going to, I was going to look this up, but I forgot. 
How many days, maybe you guys can help me. How many days can a person go without eating? 30? 30 or 40? 14? Something like that. Well, Jesus went 40 days without eating. And there are a couple other guys who have gone like 40 days without eating, right? Some guys have gone. How many days, though, can you go without drinking water? Three? Everybody knows that one, right? What do you think, Chris? How many days? Chris is like, oh, I've done 10 days without drinking water. <laughs> I think three days is the most you can go without drinking water before you start to have renal failure. So if we're spirit, simple question. How do we feed our spirit? The, the word of God, right? How do, so if we eat the word of God, what do we drink? Spirit? That's a good one. Boom. She got me. That's what I was thinking, prayer. Oh, you were saying that, prayer. And I really couldn't find in the Bible where it said that. I found that Jesus says, drink, eat my flesh, drink my blood, right? And then I found in John chapter 4, he says, he tells the woman at the well, you know, whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst again. But I'm like, but what water is this, right? Well, I did a case study with Jesus. I said, Lord, you were in the, you were in the desert. You were in the wilderness for 40 days. Um, what did you do during that whole time? What did Jesus do during the time, the 40 days when he fasted? He prayed. He often prayed. He often went away by himself and prayed. When he needed to talk to his father, he prayed. When he needed strength, he prayed. When he needed a miracle, he prayed. When he gave thanks, he prayed. Jesus is our biggest example of prayer. There are many men in the Bible who prayed. Daniel used to pray three times a day. Even when they told him not to pray, he said, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to keep praying. And Daniel continued to pray three times a day. Everybody in the Bible prays. But our biggest example, our greatest example is Jesus. One night in Matthew 26... Right before he knew they were going to come arrest him, he goes to the disciples. He tells his disciples, uh, he brings Peter and a couple of other guys with him, and he says, hey, they're about to come get me. It, it's about to happen. He's like, I need to go into prayer. Come with me, guys. Sit, sit. He's like, I, sit here and keep watch. While I go pray. So he was either keep watch or pray with me. But he said, keep watch while I go pray. So he goes a little further into the Garden of Gethsemane and he starts to pray and he's asking the Lord. He's in deep prayer now because he says, My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. I have felt that feeling. <clears throat> Not as bad as Jesus, though. But I have felt, I, you know, I've gotten into some pretty messed up relation uh, situations where I needed to pray that hard. So I, I kind of know what Jesus was going through. So Jesus went into some really deep prayer, and he asked his friends, his brothers, the ones who he had been hanging out with for three years solid, straight, every day. He said, will, will you guys come and keep an eye out while I pray? 
and he goes back after he's done praying. He goes back and he finds that they're asleep. And he wakes him up. And he's like, what are you guys doing? I, I asked you guys to watch out for me while I pray. He's like, hey, guys, I'm going to go back into prayer. He goes in a second time. And he starts praying again. This is serious prayer. This is something big is about to happen. And God really needs to get a hold of the Lord. He really needs to get a hold of his father. And I don't know if he, he was like, uh, Lord, are you hearing me? Because I'm not hearing from you. I don't know what was going on. But he goes in a second time. And he tells the, the, the disciples again, hey, check this out. I need you guys to stay up. Watch out while I go pray again. And he comes back a second time, and they're asleep again. So he wakes them up a third time. And he goes back into prayer a third time. Every time he prays, it's a similar prayer. Now, Jesus is our greatest example of prayer. But right before Jesus goes into the worst time of his life, he prays three times to the Lord. And the Bible says he prays so hard that he's sweating tears. He's, his, he's sweating and it's like blood, like droplets of blood. But what he tells his disciples is, could you not pray with me even for one hour? Could you, could you not pray with me even for one hour? See, when I was reading this, I automatically stood up and said, I'll pray with you, Lord. I'll pray with you for one hour. Because I feel like now God, as I'm reading this story, the story was a story over 2,000 years ago. But as I'm reading it, I'm like, he's talking to me now, isn't he? He's talking to me now. He's like, pray with Lenny. Pray with me. Because Jesus is always constantly praying. He's always constantly praying for us, interceding for us. His father, Jesus says that his father is constantly working. So yeah, there's, yeah they're seated on their throne and on the right throne, but they're constantly working. They're constantly working. Jesus is constantly interceding. He's looking at this world. He's not worried, but he's looking at this world, and he's like, I need someone to help me pray. <laughs> you know what I mean? He wants us to pray. He wants us to get on our knees. He doesn't need us. But the reason he made us was so that we could have fellowship with him. That's why he made us, so that we could have fellowship with him. We are, his, we are his greatest creation, and he loves us, and he wants to be in fellowship with us. And he wants our hearts to break for other people that aren't living for God, that are headed in the wrong direction, that are being deceived by other religions and by other people, and that are being deceived by Satan, by the temptations of this world, by the world, the devil, and the flesh. He wants us to pray for them, to go into battle for them. He could do it himself, but he has us for that. He wants us to feel what he feels. He wants our hearts to break for what his heart breaks for. Amen? Jesus knew that praying was going to be the one thing that was going to give us a fighting chance of making it. It is not only our lifeline, but it is our first line of defense. We don't pray at the end. We don't say, well, we've tried everything else. I guess now we'll pray because that's what we tend to do. That's why we're we, we're living backwards because the last thing we do is pray once we've exhausted all other possibilities and we just have no hope that's when we get on our knees and pray when it should be we get on our knees first thing in the morning first thing in the morning we give thanks to the lord we say lord 
today's going to be a great day. Because, first of all, if you, if you can wake up, it means God gave you that day. God put his spirit in you that day. So if your eyes open, hallelujah, praise the Lord. That's the first thing that should come out of your mouth. As soon as your eyes wake, as soon as your eyes open, say, thank you, Lord, for another day. Hallelujah, I made it. Another day. What will I do with this day? What can I do with this day? Either you, either you fill yourself with praise and worship, or you fill yourself with doubt, worry, Oh, today is going to be bad. Today is the day that I have to meet with the landlord. Today is the day that I have to meet with Pastor Lenny. Today is the day that I have to, right? Don't do that to yourself. The Bible says encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord in prayer, through prayer. If you don't know how to pray, if you don't know how to encourage yourself, Start reading the book of Psalms. Start reading the book of Isaiah. Say things like this. Let me go. Boom. I cut off my... Isaiah 26.3. Isaiah 26.3 says this. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So repeat the verse, but say it this way. Lord, you will keep me in perfect peace. Your word says that you will keep me in perfect peace. Lord, Isaiah 23 says that you will keep me in perfect peace if my mind is steadfast on you. Because I trust in you. You can say, Lord, Deuteronomy 31, 8 says this. The Lord himself will go before me and will be with me. He will never leave me. Lord, you will never forsake me. You tell me in your word not to be afraid, not to be discouraged. Use the Bible. Write down verses and use the verses to pray. God loves to be reminded of the promises that he has made you. See, God made over 600 promises in the Bible, and God loves for you to, to say, Lord, didn't you say this in your word? Didn't you promise me this, Lord? And the Lord says, I did. Of course I did. But he's dismayed when we don't read the Bible and we don't know any of the promises and we don't read any of them or, or, or any of them back to him. Because he's like, you're suffering? What does James say? You have not because you ask not. And the things you are asking for don't really matter. Not don't really matter, but they're the wrong thing. You pray with the wrong motive, so you don't really have because you're not asking. But when you use the word, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There. That's when you tell the Lord, Lord, you promise me in your word that you will give me rest, Lord. You say you will give me rest. So, Lord, I'm asking you right now for rest. I'm burdened, Lord. You say all who are weary and all who are burdened. Well, that's me, God. I'm weary. I'm burdened. And you say in your word that you will give me rest, Lord. So I'm asking you for rest right now. The Lord can't say you're asking for the wrong thing because he tells you what he'll give you, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys should memorize this if you don't have it memorized already. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Amen? Amen? Plans to give you a hope and a future. Right? Today, if you saw a homeless man on the street 
and he was completely no money, no clothes, nothing. If that man turns his life around and says, Lord, you promised me that you would give me a hope and a future. God cannot deny that man because the Lord said it. The Lord doesn't go back on his word. Amen. The Lord's word delivers what it came down to do. Oh, I wish Dennis was out here so I can have him recite uh, uh, Isaiah 55. Dennis, get out here, dude. Uh, so I can, I can have him recite Isaiah 55. But the Lord's, the Lord's, um, the God doesn't go back on his word. So if you have someone who feels that they don't have hope, feels that they cannot prosper, and feels that they don't have a future, you can tell them that they can stand on the promise in 20, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God plans, he's going to give you a hope and a future. You just have to start living for him. Start living for him, and God's going to give you a hope and a future. There, there, the Bible says that love casteth out, all, casteth out all fear. Well, the other day I called the Lord on it. I said, because something shook me the other day, and it caused me great fear, and I was tripping. And I was like, I'm not supposed to be tripping like this because I'm a Christian, because I'm a child of God. But I'm tripping right now, Lord. And, you, and, and Lord, your word, I started declaring. I started saying, your word says that love casteth out all fear. So if love casteth out all fear, Lord, why do I feel this way? And I was just crying out to God, saying, Lord, I'm not supposed to feel like this. I'm heavy burdened. I'm weary, Lord. I need rest. Give me rest, Lord, because I'm restless in my mind. James says we do not have because we do not ask. Start asking. But don't just ask one time. Continue to ask. Continue to ask. Like the uh, like the widow who 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 wouldn't leave the judge alone. She kept going to the judge, and she kept saying, and this was a judge that wasn't a servant of God. This was a normal judge. She kept going to the judge and saying, give me, give me justice. Give me justice. Give me justice. She'd go every day to the courthouse. Judge, give me justice. Give me justice. Finally, the judge was like, Fine, give this lady whatever she wants just so she can leave me alone. Jesus tells his disciples, pray like that. Pray like that until the Lord gives you what you want. Continue to pray like that. Have the faith that that lady had. She went every day to the courthouse. She woke up every morning with a great attitude, knowing that she was going to get rejected, but she didn't care. She got up every morning with a great attitude, and she went to the courthouse, and she said, I, 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 I want my justice. I want it. I deserve it. I need to have it. And the judge was like, you know what? She's right. We got to give it to her. We, gotta, we, we, we can't play this lady anymore. And the judge gave her the, the justice that she needed. How much more won't our Lord give us the justice Right? He's a just God. He'll give us justice. He'll give us what we need. Maybe, maybe, he doesn't give me a million dollars because I'm not ready for it. Because I won't know how to handle it. Because I'll quit coming to church. Because whatever. Maybe I'm not spiritually, spiritually strong enough because I haven't been praying enough. Because I haven't been close with him, closer with him. Maybe he won't give me more because if he gave me more, it would destroy me. But the reason that I don't have is because I don't ask. And so what does that mean? You need to go home and analyze what that verse means. It's in James. Uh, what is it? Yeah. I don't know the verse right now, but it's in James. 
He says, you do not have because you do not ask. Dustin will put it up on the on the screen right now, though, because he's he's a G like that, you know? Um, but I analyze that verse. Figure out what it means. What does it mean? You do not have because you do not ask. There's so much in there. There's so much in that one verse. Figure out what it is. Are you ready? Isaiah 55. We're talking about we're talking about the word we're talking about the word of the Lord, how the word of the Lord will not come back, will not return void. Okay? Now when you put the when you put the word of God in your heart, you can go to God and you can say, "Lord, you said this." So you just threw me off. I, I, I can't remember how it starts. It just okay. completely threw me off. Sorry. All right. Amen. <laughs> Here, let me... <laughs> He'll come up right now in two minutes. Amen. He always knows it, though. 5511. Look, the main, thing, the main thing to take away from today's message is prayer. Have the word of God in your heart. Have it written across your heart. Have it written in your heart. Memorize it. Carry little cards. Write down scripture. Put it on a little card and take it with you. When you're at the DMV or wherever you're at, read it. Memorize it. Memorize scripture. What else do you have to do? Get off your phone and start memorizing scripture. Start writing down scripture on a piece of paper that's not on your phone. Quit saying, oh, I'm just going to do it on my phone. Write it out on a piece of paper. Remember what a pen is and remember what paper is? Do Write it down. Write it down on a piece of paper and, and then take it and highlight it and then take it with you on a 5 by 7 index card. Amen? Start memorizing. You ready? All right. My brother Dennis is ready. Watch, watch, watch what it does to you. Here's an example. Okay, Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it in bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower, and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's what I'm talking about. The, the, word, the, the word says that just as the water comes down and waters the earth and feeds the plants and then it comes back up. He says, so is my word. It will come down and accomplish what it's set out to do because God is not a liar. You got to know your word. You got to read your word so you can know your word, so you can know how to access all the promises you have. You have over 600 promises in the Bible. 600 promises you can unlock. 600 promises you can... You can tell the Lord, Lord, you said that I can have this. You said that I can have that, Lord. You have not because you ask not. It should say because you know not. Amen? So you guys got to start figuring out what's in the Bible, what's in Isaiah, what's in Proverbs, what's in uh, uh, Psalms. Start reading this stuff. Start reading through it. Five chapters a day at least. Not one chapter a day. That's good. You could read the proverb of the day, and that's cool. But start reading five chapters a day. That'll really challenge you. We're not some weakling church. We're not some little weakling, um, well, uh, wimpy, pimpy church. Amen? We can do five chapters a day. Dustin's doing like 15 or 19 chapters a day right now. And this guy's getting filled. This guy's buff right now spiritually. Do you know what I mean? 
That's what I want from, from everybody here. I want everybody here to say, Pastor Lenny, I've been doing five chapters a day. All right. That's what it is. That's where it's at. Let me tell you something. I'm going to be real with you guys. If you're not reading five chapters a day, something's wrong. Not, not before, but after this Sunday. After today. If you can't read five chapters, but you can spend the same amount of time on TV or on a computer or at the gym or doing something else, just push play on your push play on your U version. It'll read it to you. You'll get more if you read it. But if you can't read it because you have headaches or whatever, then just push play and it'll read it for you. But if you can't push play, there's something wrong with you. Something's blocking you. There's probably a demon. Something's blocking you from doing it. Something's stopping you, spiritually speaking. Sp spiritually speaking, in the spirit, there's this giant, there's this strong man who will not let you read. He will, he's keeping you away from the word of God. There was a, there was a Bible I, I saw in church one time, and the guy had written in the front of the Bible, it said, This book will keep me from sin. And sin will keep me from this book. Amen? So analyze your life. Analyze what it is. And I promise you one thing. This, what I, this I can promise you. That if you start reading five chapters a day, spiritually you're going to start to get really strong. This is, here's the thing with cow's milk. Dr. Gundry says, don't drink cow's milk. Because cow's milk is made for cows. Babies, baby cows drink cow's milk because it's, it's made for rapid growth. So cows grow super fast with cow's milk. Humans are meant to grow slowly. We don't grow fast like cows do. But. Let me tell you something. Your spirit, you can grow that thing as fast as you want. You can grow that thing fast. You can drink spiritual cow's milk all day long until you start eating spiritual meat. So start eating five chapters a day. Start eating. It's going to challenge you. It's difficult. But once you get to five chapters a day and you start reading it every day, it's going to be nothing to you. It's going to be like nothing. You're just going to be like, oh, it's just five chapters. You're going to tell somebody, oh, I read five chapters. You're like, whoa, the Bible? That's a lot. Like, who reads that much? This world is suffering. This world needs us. It needs us. Because we have Jesus. We have the power of Jesus in us. And we need to go to this world and talk to them about Jesus, but you can't talk to them about Jesus if there's no Jesus in you. You can't. You sound like a resounding gong, right? You sound like something annoying. There's no power in you. There's no anointing in you. And you just go to people and you're like, hey, and they're like, yeah, I don't really want to hear it. And you walk away defeated. But when the power of the living God is living in you, that doesn't happen. Start investing in yourself. Start investing. Put, start putting the word of God in you. Start praying. Start getting on your knees in the morning, in the middle of the day, at night. Start with three minutes a day. Then go to four minutes a day. Then go to seven minutes a day. And just watch how God will multiply your efforts. God will multiply your efforts. If he sees that you try, God's like, I'll match you. It's like a 401k. I'll match whatever you put in. Except the 401k, the most you can get on that is 50%. God says, I'll give you 5, 10, 50, 100 fold. Amen? So, 
God will multiply your efforts. Your spirit will become stronger. Your life will begin, start to become easier. Same problems, but you'll be able to walk through those problems like nothing. Your financial problems, you'll be able, you'll, God will give you the discernment on how to get past that. God will give you the guidance. Plus, you'll have God's favor. When you have God's favor, forget about it. Nothing can stop you. Anywhere you go, anyone you talk to, you have God's favor. God's favor is everything. That's what you want. We want, we want to please the Lord. We want God's favor in our life. Because you have an enemy. You have someone that's seeking to devour you. You have someone in your life that's going to and fro, seeking to devour you, seeking, seeing how they may destroy you. And you need to have your defenses up against this guy when he shows up in your life. The one good thing about the devil is that he can't be everywhere at the same time. Right? So he hasn't, if he hasn't visited your house, he will. He'll come and he'll try to mess with you. And when, if he, when, when he sees that he can't mess with you, he'll come back at a later time. But when he does show up, be prepared. Be girded up. Amen? Jesus is always praying for us, interceding for us. Can we not pray with him for at least one hour? That's what he told the disciples. He goes, could you not pray with me for at least one hour? Like, it's, it's just one hour. It's not even that long. It's just one hour. I'm challenging you guys to go to pray one hour. Pray one hour with the Lord. Set a timer. Put on some worship music. Set a timer and say, I'm going to do one hour. Before your hour, write a list. And even in that hour, when people come to you, write a list. Start praying all of a sudden for your mom and say, my mom's on my list. Then my dad's on my list. And start putting people on your list. But pray for them as you go. And start to build this list of people that you're praying for. Start to build a list of 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 events or items or or things you need to pray for people things people places just start praying for stuff and you'll start and if you don't know how to pray sister uh megan said just start praying just start asking god for stuff just start just really simple prayers is all you need when I heard her say that, I was like, that's the best advice right there. But just like a little kid learns how to read, he learns a few words, then he learns a few more words, then he can put together a sentence, then he can put together a paragraph. That's how it is with prayer. Start really simple, and then God will give you the words. You'll just start to pour out one day and start crying, and you'll see, but... Start to give God one hour out of your day. It's difficult. It's hard to give God one hour out of our day. But try, start doing it. If you have to break it up in half and half, that's still one hour. If you have to break it up in four pieces or three pieces, that's still an hour. But give God one hour either way. Amen? Amen. Woo! Dustin's going to start a church prayer on Mondays. Amen? Lord Jesus, <clears throat> I pray for this, uh, for the people that came here today, Lord. They came to hear your word, Lord. They came to receive from you today. They have open and willing hearts, Lord. They didn't just come for no reason. They came because they knew you would be here. They came because they knew you would speak to them. They came hoping to receive from you today, Lord. Lord God, I pray you don't only fill them 
I pray you don't only fill their spirits, Lord, fill their hearts and their minds, Lord. I pray, Lord God, your favor upon them wherever they go. Uh, if they're looking for a new job, if they're looking for an apartment, Lord, whatever it is that, that they may need, Lord, I pray that they would walk around and say, I have God's favor with me. I don't need to be going through this situation. I don't need to be under this situation, your word says, Lord, that we are above and we are not beneath, Lord. Your word says, Father, that we are the head and not the tail, Lord. Your word says, Lord God, that with you our bread baskets will always be full, Lord. These are the things that your word says in Deuteronomy 28, Lord. Blessings for obedience. That as long as we're obedient, we will always have these things. Father, these are the things that you have promised to us, Lord. These are the things that we require and expect, Lord God, because you are a man of your word. Your word will, God will not be mocked, and your word will accomplish what it has set out to do, Father. So, Lord God, let us always be the lender, Lord, and never the borrower, Father. Let us always be above the situation and never beneath the situation, Father. Let us be blessed as we walk in and blessed as we go out, Father. And let us bless those around us. May those around us be blessed as well, Father. We love you, Lord God. May your face always shine upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.